in the name of Jesus Christ, our living Savior, my dear friends. The earth is flat. Did you know that there is a flat earth society? A group of people who hold to a theory that says the world is a flat disk. Not a sphere, not a globe, but flat like a plate. I see some of you smirking. At least I can tell past your mask because your eyes are squinting. How can they believe such a thing? After ships have sailed around the globe, planes have flown nonstop around the Earth, satellites have been orbiting the Earth, and we put people in a space station, and they've taken literal pictures of the Earth from hundreds of miles above, and they show that it is a sphere. You can only see part of the Earth from one side, and you have to see the other half from the other side. And yet they deny that the Earth is a, is a sphere. They believe it is flat. Now, what's the worst that can come from believing such a thing, from denying that the Earth is a sphere? I suppose you can get laughed at a little bit, right? And maybe mocked, but that's as bad as it is going to get. Today, in the lesson that is before us, we will have the opportunity to see of another theory, another belief that people had that was contrary to the truth. It was a belief about Jesus Christ being risen from the dead. And there were those who said, he is not. No real consequences? Maybe a little mockery, is that it? Well, much worse than that. As we now continue our series of sermons about the theme of Easter, Jesus' resurrection, tonight we'll see that we have special blessings that are poured out on us through believing and understanding that Jesus lives, he's been raised again, and what blessings we forfeit if we deny that, if we refuse to accept or believe it. And that plays out before us in the lesson that I read as our gospel reading this evening. On the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now, the word disciples here is referring to more than just the 12 apostles, or 11 of them that remained at this point. It was those others who were with the apostles who believed as well. And what's governing their lives at this stage? This is the Sunday after Jesus died, the third day. It's governing their lives, fear. They're terrified. They're cowering behind locked doors. Why? For fear of the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders killed their leader, Jesus. Would that be enough for them? Would they be satisfied with killing the leader? Or would now, since there's blood in the water, would they come after his followers? Would they, would they come after them? But what if they were killed too? Then what? They believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, that he was come to be their redeemer. If Jesus is dead, they've got a debt before God that's not paid. And if they die and they end up standing before God, they're going to be standing there empty-handed because they believed in a counterfeit, a fraud. They'll be embarrassed, ashamed, because they were gullible. As a result, they were filled with inner turmoil. Fear had taken over their hearts and their minds. And so like a little child during a thunderstorm in bed, they're pulling the covers over their heads to try to block out the flash from their eyes and the rumble from their ears. Is there anything in your life that's made you want to pull the covers over your head? You just wish you could get away from? You 
go to work, spend eight hours there, and you have one of those days where someone's, a client's file gets placed in the wrong folder, you can't find the record, and you're to give a presentation to them, you arrive late, and you're not prepared because it took you an hour and a half to locate it, and the client was disappointed, <laughs> didn't get their business. After all that frustration, you open the door of your home, and what do you hear? What's for supper? There's nothing in the fridge. It's too much. You come unglued, and you let everybody have it. And there's some yelling, there's some crying. You go to bed upset. The next morning, you wake up too late because you hit the snooze button three too many times. So you're rushing to get out to the car, you're already going to be late, and as you're backing out of the garage, there's the chime and the flash on the dashboard and it says, low fuel. Are you going to be even later? And your boss is going to be angry, and today is going to start out just like yesterday ended. Pull the covers over your head. Your little three-year-old's wrapped up in bandages in a hospital bed because you carelessly left the handle of a pot of boiling macaroni sticking out over the edge of the stove and your little three-year-old reached up and pulled it down on herself. One third of her body has third degree burns, her face, her chest. Her life will never be the same so ashamed. You're so guilty. You can't forgive yourself. You just want to pull the covers over your head. That's what life does to us, right? Filled with turmoil. But the problem is, even though you pull the covers over your head, that doesn't make things go away, does it? Troubles are still there on the outside. Jesus' disciples were trying to lock everything out, weren't they? But the locked doors didn't keep the fear out, didn't keep the uncertainty out, didn't keep the churning in their stomach or cause the churning in their stomach to go away. It was all still there. But there's one thing those locked doors couldn't keep out. That was Jesus. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. What a change. Jesus was alive, not dead. And what did Jesus announce to them? He said, Peace be with you. You. And they were naturally overjoyed. So what changed? Did things outside of that room change? Were the Jewish leaders now going to be okay with them? Was their life going to be completely different? No more sickness outside of those doors? No more family conflicts? No more bad weather? No more death or dying? Was that going to change? That was all the same. What changed? Jesus was alive. And that meant three important things for them. First of all, it meant that because Jesus was alive, he had overcome all human opposition. That meant that the earthly powers of the Romans and the Jewish leaders were nothing to fear. Jesus was stronger than they. It also meant that Jesus had overcome death. Death was not to be feared, even if it came at the hands of the Jewish leaders. And again, Jesus was not a counterfeit Christ. And that meant Judgment Day was not to be feared. It meant that that debt that they owed to God had been paid and paid in full. 
And when it comes to a debt, let's say you owe money on an auto loan or on a home loan, you know, they have a term for that. It's called a mortgage. Mort means death. Okay? So it, it's really talking about a, a death agreement here. Okay? You and I had a mortgage with God. See, God just doesn't want your money. No, he wants so much more than that. God tells us that he wants all of us. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. You fail to pay up. I fail to pay up. So there's a death agreement, isn't there? But thanks be to God, we have Jesus, a true Messiah, whose life and death paid our death agreement. Paid it in full. Jesus' living, breathing body is evidence, is a receipt from God that you're fully paid up. That you're at peace with him. And that you have nothing to fear when you stand before him. And so Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So you see this connection here between peace and the Holy Spirit and the pronouncement of forgiveness? You're forgiven. Your debt is paid. The Holy Spirit works through that. And he gives peace. You see, peace is not existence in a calm world. That's not the peace of God. The peace of God is being calm in a tumultuous world. Having calm in a tumultuous world. That's what you have because Jesus lives. Because Jesus lives you know how your story ends. Now, some of you like to read books, right? And uh, any good plot line leaves you hanging, right? You wonder, does the gal end up with the man of her dreams? I don't know. Does the hero die or does he live? So you know what some people do after they start reading the first chapter? They flip to the back of the book and they read the last chapter, right? They find out how it ends, and then the rest of the book is just about figuring out how they get from where they are to where they're going to end up, and it's an adventure. You can read through it, and you don't have all the turmoil going on inside you, right? Is that not what we have because Jesus lives? You know how your story ends. It ends in the presence of God. Your debt fully paid with a glorified body, with a renewed heart and a renewed mind that will never sin again. In a place where no one will ever sin against you again. That's an awesome ending. You know how your story ends. And so your life from here to there is an adventure. How is God going to bring me from where I am today to that point? Can I, and you can have peace, and I can have peace, because we know how it ends. And that's the peace that Jesus had given to all those who were in the room that night to share. And they did that. Thomas came in, and, he, and they said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So, so picture this room in your mind's eye. You've got more than a dozen people who are happy and rejoicing. Jesus lives and they got peace. In the middle of them all, there's a puzzle mug. Jesus is dead. You guys are crazy. You should be afraid and trembling. And he stayed that way for another week. Seven more days. The others had peace. Thomas didn't. Why not? Because he forfeited it. 
he didn't believe. Do you ever have a lack of peace, even though you know in your head that Jesus has risen from the dead? I do too. There are things that make my heart churn, keep me up at night. Because inside of me, just as there's inside of you, is a doubting Thomas called our sinful flesh. And it doesn't believe that Jesus lives. And we go back to fear, wondering what on earth is going to happen out of all this. Where am I going to end up? What do you do when there's doubting Thomases around you? How do you help them? Well, what helped Thomas? We are told a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then, Thomas, then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. What made the difference for Thomas? He saw Jesus. And so when you're wrestling with doubt, when those around you to whom you are sharing Jesus wrestle with doubt, what's the solution? Show them Jesus. Where is Jesus? I see him. I can't touch him. I can't put my hand in his side like Thomas did. Can you? Where do we see Jesus? Well, it's no coincidence that this portion of Scripture is followed by these comments by the Holy Spirit made through the Apostle John. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are written that you may believe. So what overcomes doubt? What overcomes unbelief? The pages of Scripture. Because in them you see Jesus and you hear Jesus, just as Thomas saw him and heard him. How do you overcome your doubting? By coming to this altar where Jesus says, take and eat, take and drink, touch me. I'm alive. I'm not a cold, dead corpse. I'm a warm, living body. And I have a home waiting for you. Because I live, you know how your story ends. You're forgiven. You're at peace with God. And that sweeps away our doubts. That overcomes our fears. And we have peace. And so as you leave here today, and you go out there into the world, there's going to be waves. There's going to be thunderstorms. There's going to be disappointment. There's going to be heartache. There's going to be death. And yet in the midst of all of that tumult, you have peace. Peace not only to hold on to, but peace to share. You have been given the authority by God to tell those who are comfortable in their sin that they are not forgiven. To tell those who don't believe in Jesus that they will be separated from him forever. You will afflict them so that in turn you might comfort them by pointing them to Jesus, the fact that he lives, that their debt is paid. And pointing them to the presence of Christ, a perfect body, and a perfect world that awaits them. Share with them the end of their story that is identical to the end of your story.
What an ending, right? And nothing that happens to you here and now is going to rewrite that ending. Brothers and sisters, Jesus lives. And because of that, you have peace. And because of that, you have something wonderful to share. May God bless you and strengthen you as you go with his peace. Amen. Please stand. Now I can